thank you very much. And I'm glad to be here and I uh, hope that y'all get something out of this today. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. I'll just be one more second. I got a little PowerPoint just to kind of help guide me too. All right. All right, so the topic is working with uh, golf players um, pre, during, and post tourney. And I, I came up with this idea because so each section of that is so different, um, working with the, the, the mentality of a player going and prepping for a tournament, what they're like in, in the, on the battlefield, and then dealing with the aftermath. Um, and so I broke it down uh, into three slides, and then I'm going to end it with the technology we use, and I'm going to give you an example of a, like a mini lesson and, and the checkpoints I'm looking at. Um, so pre-tournament, um, we're really checking the players uh, as far as this is mainly full swing, um, but I call it the fundamentals. You know, in golf, most people think the fundamentals is your stance, grip, setup, well, um, every player in the history of the Hall of Fame has a different grip, stance, and setup, and uh, it's like a signature. So the real fundamentals are uh, the things I have listed here. Uh, the best players in the world uh, hit the sweet spot consistently. Uh, when the ball's off the ground, they're going to hit the ball first and then a divot. Uh, their club face is going to be aligned pretty close to where they want that start line to be. Um, I was actually taught wrong as a kid. The, they called the old ball flight balls where – they said the ball started on path and it comes to find out after all the, the technology and track man and thing called D plane that the ball starts 80 some percent or more where the club face is aimed. So where that club face, that, that skill to be able to consistently put that club face on the ball with where we want that ball to start is one of the fundamentals we looked at. Then traject, then the kind of the bottom four there are a little more specialized trajectory, curve, distance, and trouble shots are something we'd work on um, when those top three points um, are, are taken care of. Obviously, the best player on my team is going to miss the sweet spot. My best player shoots the upper 60s, lower 70s, and complains to me all the time that he's off the heel. Uh, other players off the toe. So we're constantly monitoring why he's off the heel. For example, in his case, because he loses his posture and stands up a little bit. And he gets the swing plane a little too flat and bites the heel. So with him, we work particularly in make particularly in maintaining his posture, staying down, being more tipped over with the upper body to get his uh, sweet spot on the ball. The ball did at contact, even with the best players in the world, is an issue. Um, you'll you'll see particularly in short game shots with the best players, uh, the 50, 60 yard range uh, wedge shots um, hitting that fat when we play the ball down and the lies are tight is probably the number one mistake that I see uh, that causes bogeys. Um, so working on this, probably what I'm going to really focus with y'all on at the end with the golf swing is what I look for to get people dialed in on ball divot contact. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the swing centers. And there's three swing centers that determine where the low point is in the golf swing. And low point, you know, is uh, when the ball's on the ground, it's very important. It's also important when the ball's on the tee to hit the sweet spot as well. Um, a lot of times you hit high on the face or low on the face with driver. You don't, it's not as penal per se, because there's no fat shot or ground there. The ground, um, obviously you'll, you you'll know right away when you swing, if you uh, were off on that, um, with the better players, we, we do use track man a lot. I use a device similar to it called the flight scope X3. It's a radar based unit, uh, just like track man. The problem with track man and flight scope X3 is the radar based units. The only way they really get a good gauge on distance is if the radar device can track the golf ball all the way to the end. So our range is downhill. So it gets 80% of the ball flight and that's it. So the, the, you know, when you go to a tour event or watch the masters, you'll see the pros use two devices. They're going to have a track band behind them, but also they're going to have a device in front of their ball called a GC quad. That's really the device I'd recommend the most is the GC quad because it's capturing with a camera, the golf ball data. And it really goes into these uh, fundamentals I'm talking about, helping you figure out and diagnose what's going on um, with that strike. And so when I'm getting the players pre-tournament is we're really diagnosing why are we missing one of those main three things, the sweet spot, the turf contact, or the club face alignment. And we use video quite a bit, I'd say every day. And we're analyzing, trying to improve on that, getting the players to understand 
what they do in their swing that makes them successful um, on those three fundamentals. All right, I'm gonna move on to uh, during the tournament. So during the tournament, I use verbal cues that helps remind them of what we talked about in the pre-tournament and, and us getting um, those fundamentals, the sweet spot, club face, ball turf contact. When they're about to hit a ball or getting ready to hit, when I'm with that player, I'm always gonna say things like clip it. And that clip it means that that club's hitting that ball first, the board hits the ground. I'll say ball first sometimes. When we're in the rough, um, a successful chip or pitch shot is going to be higher on the face, not low on the face. So I'll reinforce again where that ball should be hit on the club face. Also, when you hit the ball high in the face, it's going to take spin off and it's going to launch the ball higher. So you got to swing bigger. If any of y'all know golf, if you're doing a flop shot, you got to swing pretty hard for it to go a pretty short distance because it's really deflected um, with being hit high in the face and the amount of loft you're going to do. And then I'll say a lot of things like good start line. And that, that is something I'll say every day in practice. And they know when I say good start line, I'm referring to the club face. So get good control of your club face, good ball, uh, turf contact. I will say that repeatedly throughout every time I come up to a player, um, uh, before they, uh, they hit a golf shot on any circumstance, um, uh, short game, full swing, everything. Um, I put out some strategies on here on the course that I like the kids to focus on. Um, most 50 foot putts, I would say 90%. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's high. are going to leave it short. So long putts typically are left short. And that's where three putts, you'll see the most is the, is the speed. Why people miss it on the speed? When you take a bigger stroke with the putter, there's a better chance that you're going to miss the sweet spot. So I, again, going back to that sweet spot thing, even with the putter, it matters. That's why you're seeing a lot of putters with, mallets that they say they have high MOI. A MOI, the moment of inertia, just means that it's a more forgiving putter, where a blade putter like a Scotty Cameron, if you all know what that is, is actually less forgiving. And if you miss the sweet spot from 50 feet on your putt, there's a good chance that ball might only go 43, 44 feet. Now you got a six footer uh, left. So a lot of focus on the longer putts. I tell the kids, let's get it to the hole. Good contact on the putt. Medium length putts, we're starting to think that 20, 25 foot range, you know, the percentage of a make is still low, but if they leave it short, it's a hundred percent chance they're going to miss the putt. So I always, when we're reading that putt, reinforce to the player that we are going to be getting this ball through the hole two feet. I don't like saying knock it two feet by the hole because that kind of has that negative connotation that the ball is going to go left or right of the cup. I like this to read it through the cup. So, so I always tell them, all right, this read that we're going to do is two feet through the cup. I mean, that ball is going to be rolling. I, when, we, when we train putting, we talk about three different putt speeds. You got balls that roll in the front of the lip that barely get in. Those are the most dangerous. At that speed, the ball can get affected by footprints, spike marks, little bad grass. Um, the slower the balls go and the more it wobbles. So we like to see swish speed. Um, which is two revolutions per second. Uh, if you actually did the math on it, it's going two revolutions over and over per second, and that's a swish or back of the cup. So like when we got anything five feet and in, I'm always doing that read. I'm not telling that player, we're going to go back of the cup and that gets into short putts. So short putts, less speed or uh, less break, more speed. Um, medium length putts, we're probably going to, we don't want a three putt. We don't want to knock it four feet by, even though I always tell kids that Phil Mickelson practices for hours is three and four foot putts because every birdie putt he is going to attempt is going to get past the hole because that gives him a chance and putting's all a percentage game. So, um, you can look at these devices on, on uh, that, that will roll the ball perfectly straight every time from 12 or 15 feet and not every ball goes in because it's just, and that's rolling at the same speed, same line because of the imperfections in the ground. So putting is a percentage game. So we want to give ourselves the best percentage possible by getting that ball uh, to the hole. Ideally, uh, 16 inches to two feet past the cup. Um, landing zones for chipping. This is real easy to not practice. And, and a lot of my kids, when we don't have a green, we'll put towels out to practice it's like shooting basketballs. So we got 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, putting towels out, practicing two different things, practicing um, obviously hitting the towel, landing it on the towel and the trajectory it lands on the towel. Both really matter as far as how that predict the outcome of the ball once it hits its landing zone. So when we're on the course and I'm with that player and we're chipping and he's say short-sided himself, we're chipping this ball in the fringe perhaps. 
And that fringe, we're looking at where we want to land it and why where we want to land it is so important is because where we want to land it might have a particular slope. It might bounce a certain direction once that ball hits it. So, and, and, and being able to pick that spot, predict the bounce gives us a much better chance for a successful outcome uh, on the chip shot. Um, the widening, wider, wide landing zones off the tee really comes from Scott Fawcett and Decade Golf. And that's if you all uh, do any stat stuff, I highly recommend um, uh, his system. Uh, his famous quote is play aggressive to conservative targets. And so when we go and get the print out the um, um, yardage book from his website, he's got all the golf courses and it shows the, wide, the widest landing zone for that particular hole. We're circling that in our pre-tournament prep and uh, starting a game plan, what clubs we need to hit. Then practice round comes. We have an idea. And of course, practice round, we'll change it up. If we don't like that, we want to play a little more aggressive. Uh, or if later in the tournament, we find we need to play a little bit more aggressive, we'll, we'll adjust. But it gives us a game plan going in um, with the landing zones. Uh, um, and, and that's um, par threes as well. So par threes, we're looking at, you know, some courses like Bowling Green Country Club, we just played our conference championship at severe back to front slope you do not want to be behind the pin it is and they were rolling a 10 or 11 with four or five degree slopes so it, if you're behind the pin it's treacherous and you're just praying for that ball to slope to stop and you sometimes if you're at two o'clock or ten o'clock on the putt you're going to have 10 feet of break so being above the hole it's better off making par as a matter of fact being short on the fringe uh, if the pin's front um and getting to pins, I had that last bullet point, uh, laser, uh, Bushnell lasers or the lasers they use are extremely dangerous to the player because they will laser a back pin and get 150 yards. If you hit that ball 150 yards, that ball is going to bounce um, at least 10 to 15 feet before it stops. So that ball could bounce over the green before it has a, a chance to check or spin. So we really look at that pin sheet in the morning and, and, and put some asterisks down on the back pins be careful of that back pin we do not want to go long on this hole we're going to predict that first bounce of that iron shot or that approach shot into that green um, front pins uh, um, typically we want to get um, if, if, if two different things if the pins were like where we just played it at bowling green i'm okay with them being short on the fringe chip it up uh, versus being on the back of the green sometimes though if the green's not severe we want a birdie putt. I'd rather have a birdie putt than a chip. So if the greens aren't severe, we'll go ahead and hit the distance to that short pin and have that putt back to the hole. So it really just depends on the golf course layout. But um, laser finders are very dangerous. Also, always bring in extra batteries. I always have a player, it seems like, every other tournament whose battery goes dead. And then I always bring an extra range finder to uh, carry it with me just in case the player, um, something goes wrong with it or he loses it and no one turns it in. Um, so that's my that's my during the tournament stuff is basically verbal cues and prep and planning as far as the uh, pins, the, uh, the the landing zones, um, and then using those good verbal cues to reinforce what I want that player to do as far as control. That player's um, controlling their swing, their contact, their impact of that ball um, to produce that outcome, and and us practicing that, and then having certain words that that player knows that I'm triggering in their brain. That's what what I want them to think about. Not making birdie, not an outcome on a score, but just to be successful in that shot. And then we go to work on the focusing on the next one. All right, post tournament. So this is where we really break down the stats. So this is when we're going to get a report of. Uh, what golf stat gives us and what the players keep up on their scorecards. So uh, if you're in high school, you probably got, don't have live scoring, but in college it's gone pretty much entirely to live scoring where we're keeping um, all of our tournament scores on our cell phones. Uh, so it's um, uh, these kids have access to their phones all the time and, and they don't use scorecards anymore. Well, I still have them use scorecards to keep their stats. And when they get done with the tournament, I give them a couple days because it's about the time you start forgetting the, what happened on a certain hole you got to put three rounds in because we're playing 54 holes, um, put in what happened on the, the stats for those three rounds. And then we evaluate. We'll set up a meeting with that player, that starter, and go through that uh, tournament and figure out. And usually it's clear as day. It's clear that their wedge game was off. And then we set up a plan to focus on that with either me, I work with them on their swings if they want, or a swing coach. Most of the kids have swing coaches that they work with at home. 
Um, so it's me, it's more about making sure that they've scheduled that lesson and they've, um, and they've requested that coach to work on that area that needs help. Um, we review their mindset, focus, and health. Uh, we had a player uh, this past tournament had a career round in the first round and the second round, it got worse. And third round, it was one of the worst scores. And it turns out that player was not feeling well and didn't let me know. Um, they weren't feeling well until after the um, uh, last nine holes of the third round. So we could have subbed out if I'd have known they weren't feeling good. So kind of uh, that would be part of that review is, hey, play, you know, player, whoever, let me know if you're not feeling well. I could have subbed you out. We could have got a good score in and we finished out of third place by three strokes. So you can think with four people in three rounds, three strokes is pretty easy to find. But, um, but just stuff like that, kind of reviewing communication with the player and the coach and um, uh, figuring out their mindset, how they focused in their energy level. Did they eat? Did they, did they have enough snacks? Did they drink the right things? Um, did they get enough sleep? You know, kind of work, kind of talk about just their daily decisions as far as what's getting them to be better on the course to be an athlete that's got a chance to hit the sweet spot, ball divot contact, and good club face. To be able to focus on that and not focusing on their sore throat and cough, or focusing on they're tired and haven't slept, or they're not hydrated and they're feeling weak. And then those type, your body will put those priorities way above hitting the sweet spot and the club face and the ball divot contact, which is what I want them to be really good at. Um, and then I always ask them what I could have done better. So I'm always very humble with that and, and ask them, Hey, you know, what do you think I've had? And, and many times we're not, Hey, I wish you'd have just came up a little bit more. Um, and in, in my response is, you know, when I drove up, you didn't ask for help. They're like, just come on, just come on and talk to me. And so that particular player make a mental note next tournament, you know, I'm going to go up there and just and pat him on the shoulder and then talk about the next shot. Not maybe, um, brush them off and just keep driving by check on the next player all right so last thing i was going to show you was just a sample of the uh ball divot contact i use two technologies um flight scope x3 and this um, um swing analysis app called onform o-n-f-o-r-n it's very affordable and cheap um and uh, i use it every day and it's really great in that it, all the videos that i take are saved on the cloud on their cloud, not my cell phone. And you know how fast us as coaches take and fill can fill up a memory on our cell phone. So this is a cloud-based service. I also can do voiceover recordings on here and um, film a player at practice. Maybe I didn't get a chance to really review the swing, get it home that night on the couch, look it over, do a side-by-side -side comparison. So I can go here and add another player. Um, let's look at this one here. use and you can do side by side so anyways getting to the point so i'm going to talk to you about three swing centers and this is going to go over with hitting the ball first and then the divots this could really help you so getting down here there's i always like to look at this position right here is right pre-impact where you're at and there's three swing centers in the golf swing the left shoulder the right elbow and the wrist the most important of those two is the left shoulder and the right elbow so what this is, is this yellow line, I just have it drawn up off the left heel. So not the ball, up off the left heel. And the, I like to use that in reference and see where the body and the swing centers are in reference to that lead foot. Um, you'll see a lot of bad players have that lead shoulder and lead right elbow pretty far back from that yellow line. And that's why they're fighting low point issues. So if you looked at PGA Tour players, this is a ex-PGA Tour player, Mac O'Grady. Um, you'll look at this B6.5 position and you'll see in this case, you'll watch the book club, watch the club stay in the air, hit the ball and then make the divot. All right. So that's the right elbow and lead shoulder in perfect position. And then if you can, now why I said the two most important are the lead shoulder and the right elbow, because you want the wrist to play it be a little soft. You want that, watch that right hand go from maximum bent back to only bent back about 10 degrees. So the right wrist is letting go, but that right elbow being forward and that left shoulder being um, left and up is critical to get that ball divot contact. Now this changes, we can look at this swing. Um, uh, I can move it over. Uh, the zoom thing was in the way. All right, so this is one of the guys I'm working with. And this is, this is him working on the exact same thing. 
And, and just the danger here is just his right elbow getting a little too far behind his right hip. This is a pretty good hit, though. So this is him working on it, him actually trying to get his right elbow and left shoulder in line. You can see the compression on the shaft. So this is much better. Um, example, I probably should have given you. Um, I can do it. I can probably can close this down and give you guys a somebody who's working on it. Let's say it'll go change. And we'll move into one of my students here. We'll go, uh, we'll go to Ariana. Ariana on our team. Ariana Ingalls on our team should be happy to know that you guys got to see what she's working on. And she is struggling. This was back when she was really struggling with this. So if we draw a line, oop, bear with me. I promise I'm going to make a point here in a second. If we draw a line on the left heel, I'm going to take all these circles off. Yeah. Just on the left heel. When we get to this P6.5 position, go just a little bit lower. There we go. And we compare where those hands are kind of getting in. Um, I always call P6. There's this P system, but you got club shaft parallel and then right past that in between that and impact. And then we start seeing there's some real crystal clear things of how far back things are of the ground and she fights hitting it if she doesn't hit it fat it's going to go super high or it's going to be thin so you can you can see how far the right elbow and the left shoulder is back on this left heel so her strategy was going to be getting more left with the upper body and then bringing that right arm further down playing closer to that yellow line um, before impact and that's what she's been working on so you can just get an idea. You can film yourself with your cell phones and you can probably even use the iPhone app to draw a straight line down the left heel and see. And then I'll do one more with driver. I want to show you guys this too. This is pretty interesting. Um, let me do this with uh, me. But driver, you're going to ask like, okay, that solves the iron problem. But what about, what about the driver? I'm going to show you what to do with the driver. The driver, nothing changes. And this is pretty crazy what I'm about to show you. So it's worth hanging around for this. I got so many uh, golf swings. That. Here we go. All right, it's loading up. So that's that cloud service thing where it's not on my iPad that I'm using right now. It's on this, uh, it's on their server. All right, so I'm going to go here to this P6.5 position. Now the line changes, and I can't move all those lines off, so I'm going to go ahead and throw a blue line up there for you all can see the difference. Now the line changes because the balls on a tee were swinging up at it or level. So now the line changes to here because there's the slope of the spine. So I just drew that blue line. Now look at the proximity of the right elbow, the hands, and the left shoulder from that blue line. So when this guy is pro, Mac McGrady again, hits driver, we're trying to swing up at it more because swinging up with a club with no loft, like a nine degree club, is going to produce the best launch conditions, low spin, high launch, knuckleball, bomb. So this tilt now with the spine, I, that's how I, I did left heel and went right on the angle of his spine. His hips are more forward, his head is much more back. So he's tilted like he's on an upslope. Um, but yet we're still seeing the same release within reference to that blue spine. You still see the hands over it right elbow close and left shoulder way the heck out of there. So you can see that nothing, like if people ask you, does the driver swing change from the iron swing? Really what changes are the tilts. So with the driver, you'll be tilted back more to the right and the upper body more, I call it stacked, but more um, left, more on top of the ball, trying to hit down more because we got a club with more loft. The best players in the world hit their wedges low and their long irons higher. That gives you an example. 